Again, hello everybody. Good morning. Welcome back. Day three of the China and the Maritime Silk Road Symposium webinar. So we had had such value-added presentations yesterday. Uh, great discussions as well. So we hope that that can continue today. So keep your inputs coming in, everybody. You can use once again the Q&A function located uh, on the bottom of your screen. Now, a reminder that our speakers today will be presenting in both English and Mandarin. Should you require interpretation, please click on the language interpretation icon on the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen and select your preferred language when necessary. So let us now commence our third panel uh, for our wonderful symposium. So the topic, cargoes and commodities. So we will be discussing today on the cargoes and commodities that circulated along the Maritime Silk Road. Our panel chair for this session, Dr. Sujata Arundhati Megama. Dr. Sujata is an assistant professor of art history at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. She is the editor of Sri Lanka Connected Art Histories and has published in Artibus Asia as well as the Sri Lanka at the Crossroads of History. She is currently completing a book manuscript on the patronage and production of Buddhist and Hindu temples in Sri Lanka. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the time over to our panel chair for this session, Dr. Sujata, to introduce our panelists for this panel. Dr. Sujata, please. Thank you, Lester. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to panel three of this conference on China and the Maritime Silk Road. For the past two days, we've been hearing some amazing papers, um, thanks to the Asian Civilizations Museum, which has gathered um, scholars from various corners of the world. On Friday, we were introduced to a new conceptual framework by Dr. Tansen Sen on how to think about uh, maritime connections, links, interchanges, and contact um, in a new way. Uh, both positive and messy, uh, as they sometimes can be. Um, yesterday, we heard papers about um, elephant tusks, various types of cargo, shipyards, shipwrecks, shipbuilding techniques, um, oceanic travelers, diplomacy, and much more. For today's panel, the third panel, we're going to be focusing on the stuff or the things or the objects or the artifacts that were taken um, aboard these ships and um, the various types of um, narratives uh, about production and consumption that they yield. Um, we will be following the same format as yesterday as um, Lester uh, reminded us. So all five speakers um, of this of panel three will speak first and I will uh, briefly respond and then we'll have a Q&A session. And so please send us your questions to the chat section of um, Zoom. So I would like to uh, invite our first speaker today, Dr. Himanshu Prabhare, to share her research with us. Her um, paper is titled Metals Across the Sea, Ceremonial and Display. Dr. Himanshu Prabha Ray is a research fellow at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies and was Annalise Meyer Fellow at Ludwig Maximilian University Munich from 2014 to 2019. She's former chairperson of the National Monuments Authority, Ministry of Culture, New Delhi, India, and former professor in the Center for Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, India. Her research interests include maritime history and archaeology of the Indian Ocean, the history of archaeology in South and Southeast Asia, and the archaeology of religion in um, Asia. She has recently published a book um, in 2020 called um, Coastal Shrines and Transnational Maritime Networks Across India and Southeast Asia. Um, Dr. Ray, I turn it over to you. Um, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sujatha, for the introduction. I have enjoyed the sessions, um, and I'm delighted to present some of my research uh, to all of you. Uh, let me start by saying that my presentation draws on two premises. First, that labeling maritime connectivity across the Indian Ocean as trade limits um, maritime mobility only to trade activity 
and excludes other reasons for travel across the seas. And this I think is important. We need to highlight that there were other travelers across the seas, journeys by local fishing and sailing communities, religious scholars for knowledge. This is an important um, group, um, adventurers, musicians, and the list goes on. Coastal regions have participated historically in the Indian Ocean Network, which in several cases are characterized by local traditions of boat building and navigation, architectural features, as well as narratives, uh, narratives of the central experience of translocality of maritime communities. I would argue that in the absence of nautical charts uh, in the period that we are dealing with, um, coastal architecture, particularly coastal shrines, uh, provided orientation to sailing ships and hence defined the sailing world of the ancient period. The coastal shrines had, link, had interlinkages with traveling groups that moved both across the sea as well as on routes into the interior. And this is also reflected in the ritual objects found as cargoes in shipwreck sites as will be discussed in this presentation. And I'm arguing that um, uh, we need to uh, pay attention uh, to the context of the finds and not just um, uh, look at the finds on their own. Um, next slide, please. I see uh, my internet. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the argument that I would like to make, and there are two objectives to this uh, presentation. Uh, with one is to contextualize the bronze, gold, and um, ritual objects found in shipwreck sites. And we need to contextualize them with reference to coastal shrines. And uh, that's, that's one of my arguments uh, in this paper, uh, that we need to uh, put them in context. And when we look at the coastal shrines, and when we look at these um, ritual objects in context, um, it is important to also highlight that the use of terms such as esoteric or Vajrayana, um, which we often hear of, both in secondary literature and in discussions, um, uh, is, not a good, um, is not a good term to use because it generalizes uh, ritual practices. And instead, it is important to focus on the diversity of local and regional ritual practices. And this diversity uh, uh, includes uh, uh, relic worship and relic worship across Asia was an important aspect of Buddhist ritual. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, uh, all of you know uh, the work of Peter Skilling. He's a Thai Buddhologist. He has done um, a great deal of work on relic, relic worship, uh, and the importance of relic worship in early Buddhism. Now, he argues uh, that um, early, uh, early monks and nuns did not travel empty-handed. They carried relics, and wherever they went, stoops were set up. With the relics traveled ideas, rituals, practices, technologies, and material culture. And I would argue that um, this is also valid for Southeast Asia, contrary to what one um, uh, sees in uh, traditional writings, and that relic worship was an important aspect of Buddhisms across Asia. The inscription that you see on the right is now in the Indian Museum in Kolkata. Uh, it's known as the Buddha Gupta inscription. It was found near a Buddhist temple uh, in Sebarang Parai, Malaysia in 1835, uh, and it refers to the setting up of a stoop by a mariner from Bengal on the successful completion of a voyage. Other such inscriptions have also been found, uh, such as the one from Kampong Sungai Mas, Keda, in, which was found in 1980. I, um, I would also like to bring, draw your attention uh, to the chatras, the seven umbrellas, which are on top of the stoop. And um, uh, these chatras, um, uh, I would suggest, um, uh, they indicate a special type of stoop. We often see these chatras uh, on reliquaries, and there are several examples, including in ACM, in bronze. Um, and um, there, we also see it on sculpture. And this has a special significance, which I would like to highlight as I go along in this presentation. Next slide, please. 
Um, so on the right, you will notice uh, a stoop very similar to, um, uh, sorry, um, and, um, on the right-hand side, you see a stoop very similar to the Buddha Gupta inscription stoop that I discussed just now in the previous slide. It was found in the 10th century Intan shipwreck, which, which is located 95 nautical uh, miles uh, east of the Sumatra coast. Now, there were several objects, ritual objects, also found um, in the Intan shipwreck. You can see on the screen um, the large number of bronze, bronze um, uh, ingots that were found, bronze bars, tin ingots, but also images of the Buddha. And uh, uh, it is also important to highlight uh, that uh, bronze figurines of uh, standing Buddha and Bodhisattva images, ritual vessels, votive tablets, mirrors, and mirror handles have often been found um, on, uh, um, uh, on shipwreck sites and are important uh, uh, to understand and also to uh, contextualize. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this um, is uh, um, a, uh, a slide which, uh, which discusses or shows uh, some of the ritual objects um, from the Cerebon uh, shipwreck. Uh, which is dated to the 10th century. Uh, both Cerebon and Kravang shipwrecks were found, are dated uh, to the 10th century and are found from Indonesian waters. Um, the Cerebon shipwreck was discovered on the Northwest Java coast in 2003. And like other shipwreck sites, it also carried ritual objects, including a piece of gold sheet with a Buddhist mantra, uh, a small amulet, uh, a small amulet mold and a number of beads with short invocations of Buddhist and Islamic faith. Uh, a careful analysis of the ritual objects has led Horst Liebner to suggest that the ship carried several Buddhist practitioners on board. And I would like to draw your attention, especially to um, two objects, the, the female figurine in, um, in the middle of the slide, uh, which has been identified either as Tara or Vajra Raga. Um, uh, the Vajra has often led scholars to talk about Vajrayana Buddhism and esoteric Buddhism. But at the bottom of the slide, you see a portable reliquary. And uh, this reliquary um, uh, was formed by joining uh, two cylinders uh, and was identified um, as a portable reliquary. Similar objects have also been found at other uh, shipwreck sites, including at um, Intan's uh, site, which I talked about earlier. Next slide, please. Let's move on to the Belitung. Uh, Belitung um, uh, has auspicious symbols on Changsha bowls. Um, it um, uh, has uh, also an extraordinary co uh, cargo of gold dishes uh, with auspicious symbols. You see that at the bottom, uh, the swastika on a gold plate. Uh, and in addition to the gold dishes, uh, Buddhist symbols also, um, such as swastika and the stoop, uh, were found or are represented on Changsha bowls, uh, which you see on the top left-hand corner uh, in the slide. And on the right-hand corner is the sea monster or makara. And I would like to highlight the fact that these sea monsters or makaras um, uh, are not just imaginary beings, uh, but um, at, Buddhist, uh, at Buddhist sites, uh, particularly in India, as early as the first century BC um, site of Bharat, uh, these sea monsters are represented. So they have a whole narrative, a whole story uh, associated with them and are not just um, uh, an important means or an important um, ornamentation device. Um, it, is, uh, it is also important to highlight the fact that these uh, symbols do not occur, do not form part of the Tang repertoire of ceramics. And I would like to draw your attention to Derek Heng's important paper, uh, which suggested that the Tang gold objects um, have been recovered from specific contexts. And uh, these contexts, I would argue, are very important. These contexts are either uh, Buddhist monastic sites where, um, gold, where gold objects have been found as reliquaries, uh, or uh, they are tombs. 
Uh, and so um, while we discuss the beauty and uh, of the ceramics and the beauty of the gold objects, um, I think we need to uh, we need to draw in uh, the context, which is very important, um, rather than just discussing uh, the gold objects um, uh, for uh, the possibilities for which they may have been used. Uh, next slide, please. So. So this issue of finding all these ritual objects and gold objects on shipwreck sites, then where do we locate them? And how do we find these coastal shrines? And do we know that these coastal shrines were in touch with each other? And I would like to draw your attention to, uh, to two sites. There are many more and I could talk the whole day uh, on this, but um, for in 10 minutes, I can only do two sites. And um, one is Nagapattinam, which you see on top of your, um, on, uh, on top of the slide, uh, which is on the um, east coast of Tamil Nadu. Uh, and the other is Sumatra. And uh, some of the important sites um, um, in, on Sumatra are the sites of Kotachina, Muarajambi, and Baros. And similarly, Nagapattinam is not the only, only Buddhist site that we know of. There are 140 coastal, Tamil, coastal sites, coastal Buddhist sites found um, in Tamil Nadu, uh, but which are often not discussed or talked about. And Sumatra is particularly important. You see Sumatra at the bottom and you see Baros uh, at the bottom uh, of that slide. Baros, uh, a, a, a Tamil inscription dated from the 11th century was found at Baros. Uh, the inscription refers uh, to payment of taxes by ships, uh, which called at Baros to the local representative of the Tamil Merchant Guild, the Ayavorli. Um, so th there are connections between Tamil Nadu and uh, Sumatra, and particularly important, like I've said, are the sites Kotachina, Baros, and Muarajambi as well. But also important is the Buddha image that you see on the right-hand side, it's a life-size granite Buddha image. Uh, the head is a new head. The head, it was, uh, the head was damaged and a new head has been placed. Uh, but um, the Buddha image in stone with the Buddha seated in the uh, meditation pose um, is, um, is very similar to the Buddha images, the life-size Buddha images that we found um, in hundreds in Nagapattinam district. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, uh, sorry, uh, the archaeological complex at um, Muara Jambi um, lies on Sumatra. It lies uh, 30 kilometers downstream from the present city of Jambi uh, on the Batanghari River in Sumatra. Uh, the archaeological complex was excavated. It consists of eight large Hindu Buddhist temples and more than 30 structures from 9th to 14th century uh, CE. Now, relevant for this paper are the small miniature stoops uh, which were excavated and have been reconstructed at the site, and also the finds of um, bronze and gold figurines. Uh, many of them, many of them, have been found from the riverbed, uh, but are uh, are very important as these have similarities. Um, the Buddha images, uh, particularly with those um, that were in circulation all across the Indian Ocean world. Next slide, please. Now, the, uh, the, um, the exchanges, um, you can see uh, the Tamil coast uh, on the map on the right-hand side. Um, the exchanges uh, with the Tamil coast have often been uh, discussed as part of a diplomatic and economic uh, exchanges, and we heard a paper on that um, uh, with China, particularly the Cholas, uh, but I would like to draw attention to the coastal shrine, the Churamani Vihar, which you see on the top left-hand corner, uh, which was a big brick shrine, but this was demolished um, uh, um, in the 19th century and um, a, a colonial structure was built on it. Next slide, please. What is important is that when it was demolished, a large number of Buddhist, uh, of images, bronze images of the Buddha were found and have continued to be found in the region. Please notice the stoop with the chatras on the right hand side. Next slide, please. 
this uh, tower also draws attention to what we heard yesterday from Dr. Chen and the relics that he talked about. You see at the bottom uh, the relic, uh, uh, the reliquary with the multiple chhatras again. And I think this is an issue which needs much more, uh, much more research. And I would really request uh, if this can be uh, for taken forward as well. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide. Uh, I, in conclusion, I would like to stress that ritual finds from shipwreck sites need to be studied in context. In the pre 14th century period, there were several intersecting networks that connected communities across the seas. In addition to small scale mobile fishing communities, these included traveling monks, Brahmins, and other representatives of institutionalized religion, as well as members of merchant guilds. These overlapping networks are often conflated to prioritize trading activity and the material evidence relating to them, such as coastal shrines, ritual bronzes, and the writings of traveling monks, nuns, and, bro bro and Brahmins often receives short shrift. I would again emphasize it is time to restore the balance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ray, for that um, wonderful uh, presentation that helped us think about how ritual objects um, can be further thought about by connecting them to coastal shrines. Um, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Amanda Respes to share her research with us. Um, Dr. Amanda Respes recently took up the position of Assistant Professor of Pre-Modern World History at the University of Ohio State Marion. Her PhD awarded in 2020 in Anthropology and History at the University of Michigan uses shipwreck artifacts from the Maritime Silk Road to understand medical and cultural exchange between medieval China and Iran. And today, Dr. Respes is going to talk to us about Islamic inscriptions on the Belitum Bowls, 9th century Changsha designs, the opposite market. Dr. Respes? Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. Uh, thank you to our hosts and organizers for putting together such an exciting series of presentations and conversations, and to all the other panelists who have shared their fascinating work. Because I am talking about Islam and the Arabic and Persian languages, it's worth clarifying from the outset that the terms Abbasid, Muslim, and Islamic do not necessarily mean Arab, and quite often don't when related to Tang Dynasty trade with China. slides working here. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Uh, among the extraordinary objects recovered from the 9th century Beletung shipwreck now housed in the collections of the Asian Civilizations Museum are well over 57,000 bowls produced in the Changsha kilns of China. This multitude of bowls has been identified by scholars like Dr. Gai as the largest assemblage of Tang Dynasty trade ceramics ever found, but it has remained something of an interpretive challenge because of the unique nature of the designs on the surfaces of the objects, which seem somewhat out of step with other Tang Dynasty material culture. The designs on the bowls have been the subject of analysis and some debate, and have been described in publications associated with the collection and its exhibition history from the standpoint of Chinese art history, looking at the motifs of mountain landscapes, clouds, foliage, and animals on the surfaces, as well as the style of brush brushwork found on the objects. A number of the bowls have Chinese inscriptions, and some scholars have also pointed out what appear to be Arabic inscriptions on some of the pieces, and argued that these designs likely represent imitation Arabic or unskilled Arabic produced by artisans who were not literate in the language, while others have dismissed or strongly denied the possibility of Arabic designs on the bowls at all. After extensive analysis of the photographed interiors of the Beletung bowls, at the Asian Civilizations Museum, I argue that a great many of the bowls are in fact inscribed with Arabic and Persian letters, text, and calligrams. These inscriptions often group into large subcategories of genre and style, including some inscriptions that are clearly legible to readers of Persian and Arabic, 
and many that are not quite legible, but provocative and meaningful nonetheless. Many of these groupings seem to be centered on symbols from the life of the Prophet Muhammad, recounted in Hadith and in the Quran. The bowls are frankly hard to read. They are difficult to make sense of. But I will argue in this paper that that is intentional. Although Chinese art historical analysis has proved critical and extremely fruitful in understanding the bowls, I argue that these materials can be better contextualized and more fully understood by broadening the frame of their analysis to also include Abbasid cultural production and tastes in the Persian Gulf region at the time of their creation. Shards of similar Changsha bowls have been recovered on the coasts of the Persian Gulf and inland in Iran, and it is widely believed that the shipwreck bowls were ultimately destined for Abbasid markets. Regina Kral and Dr. Chittick in this weekend's webinar have described the unusually direct association between foreign merchants and the Changsha kilns, and that association may be much more involved than we have previously understood. In the keynote lecture of this webinar, the value of inscriptions as linguistic evidence was pointed out by Dr. Sen and again by multiple panelists yesterday. And the Arabic and Persian inscribed Belitung bowls provide an especially fertile area of research. I propose that the most valuable framing we can make in the discussion of these inscriptions is no longer are they or aren't they Arabic, but rather how does their textuality and design fit in with Islamicate tastes and practices in the period? And what can that tell us about cosmopolitan cultural production in Changsha? The most efficient way forward in our limited time to approach the Changsha bowls from the standpoint of Abbasid consumer desires and cultural tastes is to first focus on the use of pseudoscripts on Near Eastern ceramics, on the aesthetics of ajab or wonder that infused Abbasid material culture and on the demand for Chinese products generally within the Persian Gulf region. This context will help us understand why the designs on the Changsha bowls would have appealed to Abbasid markets and the potential meanings the inscriptions would have had for Muslim audiences. Pseudoscript was an extremely popular feature of Abbasid ceramics and recent scholarship has moved away from a view of pseudoscripts as merely the knockoff work of illiterate artisans towards an analysis of these inscriptions as symbolically meaningful in their own right. Furthermore, pseudoscript is one aspect of a larger spectrum of textual practices in Persian and Arabic that intentionally create meaning through subversion and play with linguistic norms of reading and writing to evoke wonder in mystical registers. Religious studies scholar Daniel James Waller characterizes pseudoscripts as ostentatious displays of non-writing and inscriptional practices that perform and magnify the act of writing without necessarily contributing lexical content. In his formulation, pseudoscripts blend together the domains of text, speech, and performance reading and recitation, and instrumentalize the acts of writing and inscription as magical technologies. Pseudoscripts were a common feature of incantation bowls, sometimes called demon bowls or magic bowls in the Near East across religious and linguistic communities before, during, and after the Abbasid period. Ceramic and later metal magic bowls inscribed with misspelled, scribbled, and illegible Aramaic, Arabic, and Persian were used to repel demons and attract divine blessings. The utility of their illegibility may have resided in taboos on directly inscribing the holy or the practical inability of malevol malevolent forces to correctly read one's deepest prayers and wishes if you hide them through disruption. The evil eye can't ruin what it can't read. But the intentional disruption of legibility has had other functions in the Islamicate world. Art historian Matthew Sabah has asserted that artistic tastes in the Abbasid realm demanded the experience of wonder from consumer objects, a specific aesthetic that produced the sense of one's eye being confounded during the act of observation 
thus forcing the viewer to contemplate the limits of human knowledge and seek for signs of the divine creator. For example, the ceramic shards on this slide are from iridescent metallic glazed Bukalamun luster wares that appear to flash different colors of light depending on the angle of the viewer and the light source. Other Abbasid ceramics used mirror imaging and dense patterns that mimicked movement. This process of confounding the eye enhanced the enjoyment of art and granted it spiritual merit. Like optical illusions, the aesthetics of Ajab forced contemplation. A viewer is forced to look past the confounding surface for deeper meanings, not unlike the hermeneutic task of looking past exoteric readings of the Quran for esoteric meanings that can only be deciphered by the discerning eye. Abbasid visual culture relished the distinction between the hidden and the manifest, and it infused material design and consumption in the Abbasid Persian Gulf. We have limited time, so let's just examine a few examples of bowls from the Beilatung Rek to see how their visual echoes, pseudoscripts, Kilograms and mirror image texts complicate our gaze. Many of the bowls have markings that appear somewhat random when taken individually, but when you compare position, stroke length, and shape across thousands of bowls, you see consistency in patterns. In these cases, these markings form somewhat abstract designs resembling the movement of clouds, but to Arabic and Persian readers, clear elements of letters and words appear in the mist. He, mim, sin, dal, vav, re, ligatures and contractions that are used again and again across the tens of thousands of bowls in consistent combinations. It's a world of words. This bowl contains similar cloud letter configurations, but also features visual echoes and a more legible inscription, Muhammad al-Rasul, Muhammad the Messenger. This extremely common calligraphic representation of the Prophet's name is clearly recognizable on this bowl. But the next image in this kilogram of a bat, a Chinese symbol of good fortune, his name is hidden and mirrored. Mirroring of his name is still a common calligraphic practice, as is the use of letters to outline the shape of animals and other objects. I'm waiting for my slides to catch up with us. Perhaps the most recognizable and frequent Arabic inscriptions found on the Beletung bowls are mirror image calligraphic representations of the word Allah, which would have been the objects also of the most frequent debate among scholars. They often appear with textual clouds of vapor emanating from the top like mountain peaks, and Liu Yang has read these images correctly, in my view, as mountain landscapes but they are not just landscapes. In the Quran, in a surah often called Ikra, which means read or recite, Muhammad receives his first revelation from God from the angel Gabriel. The verses describing this event are regarded as among the earliest words of the Quran to have been revealed, and the episode has become a symbol of God's power to grant knowledge in the form of the revealed or written word. The angel commands Muhammad to read, to recite the words of God, but Muhammad protests in distress that he cannot read. The angel commands him again, read, and after taking him in his arms, Muhammad is granted access to the words and the ability to recite God's book. Illegibility and inability with language is transformed into discernment and divine knowledge. This is the liminal threshold of wonder. Importantly, this miracle occurred in a cave on Mount Jabal al-Nur near Mecca.
which has become a symbol of the incident and of God's power to reveal the hidden through the language of divine revelation. For Muslims, the mountain is a symbol of Muhammad's prophethood itself and the revelation of the Quran. The mirrored Allah form on the bowls resembles the contours of this mountain and the textually infused vapor that emanates from the peak is redolent with multiple confounding meanings. Contemplation of the symbolism of the bowl embodies the sacred experience of God's sudden granting of comprehension in a manner similar to depictions of the Bodhi tree in Buddhist art. It is a thunderclap moment in Islam and the resolution of the confounded eye. Other vignettes from the Quran and the prophet's life seem to be represented in the bowls and visual references to date palms and beheaded birds. But in the interest of time, I will conclude here with the statement that we contemplate hybridity in the composition of material objects from the trade routes. But we must also stop to consider hybridity of meanings. Chinese art objects were sought out by Abbasid consumers and new forms emerged from hybrid cultural exchanges between the Islamicate world and China. The Beletun bowls at the Asian Civilizations Museum represent a significant chapter in this material and symbolic exchange and are infused with meanings resonant for consumers in the ninth century Persian Gulf. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Respes, for this really interesting um, talk that places your objects within a larger group of objects, but then also um, gets us to really go beyond the standard narrative of how they've been in interpreted and then you put place them within this new religious discourse of wonder. Um, we are going to move on to our third panelist, Dr. Guy, John Guy. Dr. John Guy is the curator of the arts of South and Southeast Asia at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, an elected fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, London, and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has participated in a number of um, archeological excavations, including maritime sites in Southeast Asia. His most recent um, publications include woven cargoes, Indian textiles in the East, um, which was printed in 1998, and then a reprint came out in 2009. Indian temple sculpture in 2007, with a reprint in 2017. Interwoven globe, the worldwide textile trade, 1500 to 1800 in 2013. And lost kingdoms, Hindu Buddhist sculpture of early Southeast Asia, 2014. He's currently engaged in an exhibition project and publication on early Indian Buddhism. Today, Dr. Guy is going to speak to us about green, blue, and white, the Belitung Tang ceramic cargo, and the nature of West Asian interactions in the ninth century. Dr. Guy. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, delighted to be here. Um, good morning, everyone. So the title of my paper uh, really raises a series of questions. I want to address those questions um, in, in the, the, the 10 minutes that we have. So I set out to test the assumption that's implicit in this title, that the stylistic innovations are evident in the painted and splashed white wares of the Belladon cargo and the, the blue and white uh, wares also uh, discovered in that shipwreck are an expression of market forces, specifically that they reflect a demand for glazed and decorated Chinese ceramics from merchants serving Persian Gulf clientele. Uh, this uh, position really arose out of a uh, very uh, heated debate uh, in the late 90s, uh, when soon after the 98-99 excavations of the, of the Balatung um, and the question of where the cargo was destined uh, to be to be sold, uh, essentially. And um, being found in the West Java Sea uh, raised many possibilities, of course, with uh, the North Coast, the commercial epicenter, great economic power of central Java as a major ma uh, magnet for the market, or where they intended to go beyond Java 
or indeed to serve both markets in turn trading on route, which is probably the more likely scenario. The question of a technical and stylistic dialogue between China and the Iran-Iraq world is a vexed one and has been confused by a tendency to look for the link between these traditions in the Chinese Sensai three color uh, wares, which are an innovation largely of the seventh century. This is a position taken by uh, uh, Bill Watson and others, um, and um, continued on uh, really into very recent scholarship. Um, I would contest it was, uh, it was widely consumed, assumed that the Persian gold ceramics followed the examples of China and specifically the Sansai ware in their decorative innovations. Um, I think the evidence we have now from the Belladon, um is uh, uh, puts that argument uh, to rest. Uh, the evidence in the Persian gold dialogue with Chinese ceramics is much more of a ninth century phenomenon. Um, and I would argue we must look to other ceramic types and decorative styles, this form and decoration to establish a more convincing case of these innovations and to define questions of stylistic exchange more precisely. Uh, the large, very significant group of some 200 uh, green glazed wares uh, that were recovered. Um, okay, just to bring this up on the screen. Uh, some 200 green splashed glazed wares and the three Seriously, only three examples of what I call inglaze blue, uh, uh, blue and white, uh, recovered from the Belladon, provide the first archaeologically secure and datable evidence for addressing this question. Uh, this paper sets out to argue that through the analysis of the ceramics associated precious metal objects, uh, we can establish a more convincing case for defining a role that Arabic speaking and Persian speaking merchants played in shaping the in export innovations that are revolutionizing 9th century Chinese ceramic production. The 8th and 9th, cent 9th centuries represented a remarkable period of effervescence and experimentation in Asian trading world. The boundaries were being stretched as never before. Um, and of course, we have the three shipwrecks which were discussed yesterday, your time, um, uh, uh, which were presented the better to the Panom Seren and the, uh, the Chao Nam from Vietnam, each uh, witnessing a different aspect, but also overlapping significantly uh, and with many shared features. And China, of course, uh, was had a great appetite for lux luxury goods, both for court and urban elites. Um, and we know of Chinese sources from the seventh century recording frequent missions to, along the Central Asian Silk Route, Samarkand and elsewhere, uh, seeking new skills and products. You know, Chinese weavers, goldsmiths, painters active in Iraq uh, in this time. We know of also the traffic and skills uh, coming the other direction, artifacts and people uh, coming to China, to Chang'an and to Xi'an, uh, to, to, to Bang China. Uh, we have a Persian Nestorian temple being built uh, in Chang'an in 638, Manichaean temples as well in Luoyang, uh, the Taiyuan uh, temple built for, by the Uyghur uh, community in 807, um, clearly bringing in uh, skilled artisans to assist with each of these religious monuments for the expatriate merchant communities in those all based in, um, in Xi'an. So in addition to this, we have fine, some of the finest surviving Iranian metalwork uh, being imported into Tang China um, and of course Chinese ceramics uh, glazed wares finding a ready market in the Islamic lands. So this two-way process of uh, stimulating local imitations and stylistic offsprings of various sorts. Sense of Arabic literature, uh, which was touched on yesterday, um, uh, gives us a glimpse of the, the dynamics of all of this. Uh, the rise of Basra as the principal port of Baghdad, uh, the port of Siraf in Iran, uh, both uh, uh, largely drawing their wealth from the China trade. Uh, Syrup seems to have entirely based its wealth on long distance uh, enterprises. Uh, with the Book of Wonder that was referred to by Danson um, again documents uh, this phenomenon. The author was based in Syrup. Um, and it goes on, there's a great list uh, of, we do of the uh, great uh, Syrafi merchant, Abdul uh, Qasim Ramish. Um, 12th century uh, ship owner um, who uh, single-handedly uh, funded the purchase of Chinese silks to decorate the Kaaba at Mecca. Uh, clearly large quantities 
extremely uh, prestigious uh, active uh, benefaction. So Chinese silks were clearly uh, a major part of all of this uh, exchange as well, uh, even though we have nothing much surviving from, uh, from the maritime context, actually. This uh, growth of the maritime routes, uh, the emergence of these shipwrecks, all in this relatively tight late 8th and early 9th century time frame, witness something, something very new and very important. It's not only, I think, the insecurity of the Central Asian uh, overland routes, but the growing confidence of the Islamic uh, world, the prosperity of the Islamic land, lands uh, played a part in all of this. Uh, we have the, uh, these interesting um, landmarks in Ch South Chinese history and inter interracial commercial community relations, the Arab and Persian uh, uh, sacking of uh, Guang Guangzhou in 758, um, and within uh, and then the persecutions in, uh, uh, in uh, Hangzhou following that in 1760, uh, Guangzhou not reopening to foreign merchants till 792. Between those through dates, 1758 through to uh, reopening of Guangzhou, 33 years, and with 35 years after that, after 792, more or less, we have the sailing of the Balaton. Um, in the second quarter, of the um, ninth century. So this is a very, uh, collecting its cargo, probably largely in Yangzhou, um, and then repackaging, uh, containerizing the cargoes in Guangdong in the, in the ubiquitous storage jars that we've seen. I have on the screen, uh, on the upper uh, image of the uh, Changsha material in situ on the uh, seabed, um, would been, uh, this material, much of that would have been packed in straw and rattan, which has perished, of course. Lower left, uh, uh, along Seren wreck during excavation um, in 2014, and on the on the right of your image, uh, uh, the one of the one of several uh, illustrated editions of the famous uh, El Hirani uh, manuscript from the 13th century, uh, showing an Arab bell clearly in distress with broken mast and so on. <clears throat> but these give you a sense of what's happening at this time frame. We have two very important works from the end of the 8th century and the middle of the 9th. One a Chinese uh, work by Kai Tang uh, in the, as a, a section of the new history of the Tang, uh, which itemizes the sea route taken from Guangzhou to Baghdad. And then within a, a space of 40 or 50 years, Yubu Kruger did, uh, publishing his uh, description of the sea route from the Persian Gulf to South China uh, in Arabic. Uh, so this was well documented by this period. Just my clicker. Attempting to change the image here. Okay. So, uh, as I say, this uh, trade route was established from the Persian Gulf from Basra uh, to uh, Guangdong and to uh, the other sun southern Chinese ports. Of course, was the, the longest maritime route in history at that time. Uh, unrivaled uh, in its complexity and dangers, but of course yielded great rewards for those who were successful. Uh, the, uh, we have extensive uh, evidence of the uh, introduction of Islam uh, coming with uh, the merchant communities in the south, the foundation of the, the seventh century foundation of the famous mosque in Guangdong that's on the screen, the uh, Huai Sheng, um, and um, Uh, Guangdong also uh, evidence that the Bellatung cargo was re-containerized uh, at that port. Uh, and so uh, two images both taken on board the recovery vessel by Michael Flecker, uh, who provided these photographs very kindly, images of the Chang Cha wares packed within um, out of the, uh, the Guangdong storage jars. Um, one's reminded, of course, of the 12th century description in which uh, of one of the uh, controllers of commerce in the South Indian, uh, South China ports, in which they speak of ceramics being packed. So uh, not a crevice remained between, packed tightly within straw in containers. And on the right, a uh, Staranese, a uh, Chinese uh, condiment spice, uh, again, packed for uh, containerization uh, and chipping. 
Sorry, my slide changer is a little slow here. Okay. Um, coming, following on from uh, the previous speaker, the use of um, pseudo, uh, pseudo Arabic um, uh, and, uh, and also sometimes a virtually pseudo Chinese. Um, we are uh, appearing on many of the uh, large storage jars uh, on the upper uh, image. You have the Chinese inscription on the lower right. Uh, fragments of the so-called Dusan jars, these are the Guangdong storage jars uh, with uh, Arabic uh, ins uh, inscriptions and of course these inscriptions were incised into the wet clay so at the point of making. So clearly these were vessels that had been, uh, someone had commissioned X number of vessels to be made uh, for their personal use and they were identified with usually with a proper name, um, presumably of the merchant uh, uh, or the consortium involved. So, and of course, these containers uh, traveled and had a long life um, uh, and, and almost certainly were reused. Um, what was valuable and was the primary purpose of the transaction was the, uh, of the contents. Torpedo jars showing up for the first time. Um, and um, so on the left is the, the one example of a classic narrow necked pointy bottom torpedo jar and the Bellatong. And on the right, uh, from the Phnom Seren shipwreck, um, uh, the uh, most complete of uh, several examples of this wide-mouthed torpedo jar, uh, which again uh, have a very a body which we can uh, seems very much to belong to the Persian Gulf world, um, and um, one of which carries a inscription which I published in 2016. Um, as indicating it's a Pallavi inscription and giving a proper name, almost certainly the merchant uh, who, who owned that particular container and, and then the, the contents thereof. Uh, so we have a, a growing body of, of evidence of, of Arabic and Persian speakers, but also now for the first time with the Phnom Serenric, we have the Pallavi speaking merchants uh, active in uh, not just in long distance trade, but what seems to be uh, in interregional trade in Southeast Asia. The, uh, the Phnom Seren uh, wreck, which we heard about yesterday, um, was is located at the, at the uppermost limits of the uh, Gulf of Thailand um, in um, mangrove, uh, uh, reclaimed mangrove um, uh, land today, um, and it was uh, clearly involved in uh, linking up to two major river systems, almost certainly. Uh, trading upriver to major Dwaravati Mon uh, cities, Nakhon Patom, and possibly even up to Utong. So this is part the, the internet interconnections and are not just long distance point A to point B, but also interregional trade as well. Okay, so when we look at the, the cargo from the uh, the, the Bellatung, um, we have a whole, a whole range of ceramics, and what you have on the screen. Is material recovered from the Thai Peninsula, a Suratani uh, district, uh, in which we essentially see all the same ceramic types that we discovered in the Belatung so many years later, already being recovered from transshipment points. These were nearly all collected in riverine and, and beachfront uh, 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 sites, which clearly were wastage during transshipment uh, on, on the southern Thai Peninsula. And as you can see, the, uh, under directly under the Suratani, there's a, a heading, there's the large Busan storage jar, there's UA greenwares, there's monochrome whitewares, uh, flood decoration, green splashed wares, brown wares, and so on. Uh, a, a B foot uh, bowl, and then a cluster on the other image of Changsha wares. Uh, many, many of the types we recognize from the Bellatung here in great numbers. These are photographs I took at the site museum in the 19, 1980s. Um, and this material wasn't well identified at that point, uh, but it was uh, well recorded, or at least recorded and preserved. So on the Bellatung itself, well, we have classic three types of white wares, three different kiln sources. I won't go, have a time to go into the details plain and, and, and um, indented uh, white bowls. These white bowls, particularly the ones uh, from um, the Guangxian kilns, uh, become the, the, the vehicle for other decoration, for incised decoration and application of green splash. So pure monochromes and then 
monochromes that have then been uh, had a, a supplementary decoration, um, usually in uh, uh, copper green. Uh, on the screen here, the three fragmentary uh, examples, um, upper left, upper right and lower left, um, all uh, examples of Chinese green splashed wares from Samara in Iraq, excavated by the Germans in 1912, uh, confiscated, confiscated by Lawrence of Arabia, sent off to London, uh, shared between the British Museum and the V&A. On the right, a uh, more recent excavation of the same class of ware coming from the Pelos complex at Nara in Japan. So you can see the full breadth of this trade that was happening at this time um, and operating, uh, of which the Bellatung uh, is representative. Lower left, another Samara excavated bowl now in Berlin, um, and the upper examples are both Bellatung and on the lower right, the beginnings of another innovation, which is to use combination of co cobalt blue with the green glaze splashed wares. A particularly interesting example on the screen here on the Bellatung, uh, it's complete uh, saucer dish, white in uh, looted uh, bowl, and with the molded interior uh, decoration, uh, particularly interesting to ceramic specialists because this molded decoration we tend to think of as a, a late Song, early Yuan innovation, or at least, at least Northern Song anyway. Um, and here we have it uh, clearly much, much earlier uh, appearing in this bowl. It upsets the uh, orthodox chronology. And on the right, uh, the fragmentary example. Uh, uh, which was uh, excavated in Nishapur in Iran in the 1930s, um, now in the Met. Uh, so you can see the way in which uh, uh, the Bellatung piece fits perfectly into the archaeological record from, from West Asia. Spectacular um, large storage jars, there were over 200 green splashed wares in the cargo, uh, upper left, upper right. Uh, both Bellatung, the small jarlet in the center, uh, is in the unrecorded provenance in the National Museum in Jakarta um, and is set unidentified uh, there for uh, decades, uh, long before the discovery of the Bellatung, which of course finally gave us an explanation uh, for identifying this piece. The piece on the right, uh, which has the uh, very elaborate uh, strap handle in the form of a leaping leopard, the spout in the form of a makara, uh, clearly coming out of Iranian uh, metal prototypes, which have found their way into China um, and then been um, replicated in ceramic um, and shipped back to, uh, to the Gulf world. So a cyclical process of, of, of exchange taking place here. Uh, and of course, that's the uh, most spectacular demonstration of this cyclical uh, uh, dialogue that was going on stylist Exchange is the great meter high. Uh, uh, you were on the uh, left, uh, totally spectacular uh, object, uh, un unprecedented um, in terms of survival, nothing like it uh, recorded uh, in China, um, and uh, clearly based on metal prototypes. Uh, here we have on the, on the right, uh, what I would argue is a, uh, a Chinese copy of an original Iranian import, um, now preserved uh, in, uh, in Nara, um, uh, preserved in the traditional collections of Nara in Japan, um, and uh, almost certainly imported during the late Tang dynasty. Uh, so the metal prototype directly replicated, and it's very clear when you look at the uh, detailing of the uh, big ceramic ewer, uh, that the technology has been copied oh, absolutely and explicitly, the strap handle, the way in which it's riveted in, in clay, uh, not necessary, this is not structural, this is referencing metalwork. Uh, but I want to particularly focus on this uh, lozenge design with the four palmet projections you see beneath the, the strap handle, that's repeated on a uh, little dish and a large covered box. Um, and uh, it really becomes the signature motif of the Bellatum cargo. And I think one of the single strongest arguments for uh, insisting that this cargo was primarily intended for a West Asian clientele. Here we have on the left, another piece from Samara, now in Berlin, again with the same design, um, lightly engraved and green splashed. 
And then in Basra, we see the beginnings in the 9th and 10th century of this very innovative use of cobalt uh, using the same, essentially the same motif. This is not a Chinese motif. This is unknown in Chinese decorative repertoires at this point. Uh, and it has to have come through the medium of Iranian uh, Gulf, I should say, not just uh, Iraqi, Iranian, Persian Gulf um, uh, imagery um, shared uh, presumably by merchants uh, with the producers of the materials in China. The green splashed wares, the use of uh, cobalt in an indigenous uh, uh, Gulf context, lower left, um, and the various splash uh, decorations uh, we see, Peloton and then uh, Iraqi wear. The Iraqi, the Basra uh, potters uh, produced a great variety of richness of material, uh, which you see here. I have no time to go into the individual motifs and their uh, particular lineages. But to focus rather on the three uh, blue in white uh, bowls um, from the Bellatung, um, uh, small saucer dishes, inconsequential pieces in themselves, except they've been decorated with cobalt, uh, very un into the painted directly into the wet clay. It's very difficult, of course, to control this bleeding. Uh, it's almost certainly the reason why this technology was abandoned and not really revisited until the early Yuan period or late Song, depending on you, which school of thought you follow. Um, and um, it was applied to hi-fi porcelain bodies and was uh, much more stable. Um, but the significant point here is we have again the lozenge with the floral or uh, uh, projections uh, palmet projections, uh, clearly the same motif we see on all the, on the green splashed wares uh, of the same cargo. And um, here, uh, to just to reinforce the point, the, this very beautiful fragment of a spout of ewer uh, from Yangzhou, uh, which was um, excavated only in 2003 in the Tung uh, harbour area of Yangzhou city, um, and uh, was clearly an export item uh, destined for West Asian markets and shares. It's identical motif that we see uh, on the Bella Pong, and I would argue could be dated close uh, to that in the early 9th century. And just to conclude, um, with th three pieces from this early Basra piece with the palmettes uh, radiating from the centre, uh, the Bellatong saucer dish in the second, and then third, the highly elaborated Basra ware that's being produced uh, by the 10th century, uh, continuing on this, this process uh, of cultural uh, exchange and cross fertilization. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that interesting paper on the um, Belletun um, cargo, um, bringing attention to the green splash where that we often um, don't pay much attention to since we are so obsessed by the blue and whites. Um, so now we are going to move on to our, our fourth speaker, Dr. Zhao. Um, and Dr. Zhao is, um, he received his PhD from the Southeast University School of the Arts. Um, China and has 30 years of experience in the study of ancient ceramics. He's currently a professor at the Art and Archaeology School, Jingdezhan Ceramic Institute and the director of the Chinese Ceramic Culture Research Institute. He's also the vice president of the Oriental Ceramic Society, Jingdezhan, and chairperson of the Jingdezhan Qingbai Porcelain Research Society. Dr. Chow is going to be speaking to us about Krak Porcelain and the Maritime Silk Road. And um, there will be a, a simultaneous translation, so please remember to uh, switch to English on your um, Zoom in the bottom right um, corner. Dr. Chow? Uh, can you hear me? 女士们、先生们，大家好，我是来自中国景德镇桃子大学的曹建文，很高兴参加这一次有关啊海上丝绸之路的这个网络会议啊。那么我的演讲题目呢，是海上丝绸之路与克拉克瓷器啊。<咳
，那么海上丝绸之路啊，这个应该说，啊，它就是陶瓷之路，啊，那么陶瓷之路这个概念呢，是最早实际上是日本的古陶瓷学者啊，山上次男先生，在上一个世纪六十年代就提出来的，啊，因为他考察了，啊，通过大量的考察呀，啊，这个认识到海上贸易通道啊。这里面出出水了大量的这个贸易陶瓷，啊，所以把海上丝绸之路啊概括为陶瓷之路。我认为这一点应该说，通过最近是吧几十年的这个水下考古，应该说证明了这一点，确实海上丝绸之路可以说就是陶瓷之路。那么海上丝绸之路呢？我认为可以分为两个大的阶段。第一个阶段呢，应该就是以十五世纪啊为这个界限啊来划分。十五世纪以前呢，是以阿拉伯人为主为主导的一个太平洋加印度洋的这个阶段。第二个阶段呢，十五十五世纪以后，以欧洲人为主导的。太平洋加印度洋加大西洋的这样一个阶段，啊，这是我认为啊，整个海上丝绸之路可分为两大阶段。那么在第一阶段，刚才前面的这个专家我看到啊，主要是讲前面的第一个阶段的这个海上丝绸之路，特别是唐代啊，这个发现的这个黑色号沉船，应该说就是以第一阶段呢为代表性的一条沉船。啊，关于这条沉船呢，大家应该非常熟悉了，我在这里也就不再展开啊。那么这个是第一阶段的这个海上丝绸之路的应该一个啊，应该一个地图。那么反映了这个黑石号沉船呢，它的路线，啊，以及啊它的这个地点，啊。那么十五世纪以后呢，应该说主要是以葡萄牙、西班牙为主导的，啊，一个大航海时代，啊，应该说，所以开始了第二个阶段的海上丝绸之路。那么，当然，同时期中国的明朝政府也于隆庆元年（公元一五六七年）啊，开始正式废除了海禁政策，开放了澳门和漳州粤港的对外贸易，从而大大推动了海上丝丝绸之路的发展，从而也使得中国的外销瓷器从亚洲发展到欧洲、美洲，第一次应该说。真正走向了全球化，那么也就是说，那么中国的这个陶瓷的海上丝绸之路，第一阶段实际上主要还在亚洲的范围进行，那么到了第二阶段呢，才真正开始了全球化的这样一个啊陶瓷的贸易路线啊，这是，那么这张图呢就反映了十六世纪啊到十八世纪啊啊之间的直接海上贸易的路线。下一张啊，那么下面我们正式看一下第二阶段为代表的啊海上丝绸之路的贸易产品，就是克拉克瓷器啊啊，也就是啊克拉克瓷器呢，我认为是十六到十七世纪啊海上丝绸之路最重要，也是数量。啊，最多的一种贸易产品。那么克拉克瓷器的名称呢？当然，在学术界还有不同的理解。啊，那么它实际上它的名称最早是来源于啊，十六世纪的葡萄牙的啊这个货船。啊，当时这个葡萄牙这个货船呢，应该说当时的名称称为克拉克啊，克拉卡啊。由于这种贸易商船呢。
，在这个这个期间呢，大量的印度啊，中国瓷器啊，在这个贸易路线上，而且一直到了欧洲，所以大概可能是河南人，应该说最早啊，把这种运送到欧洲的中国瓷器啊，称为克拉克瓷器。葡萄牙人可能不一定最开始把这种瓷器称为克拉克瓷器，这种名称可能是荷兰人取了啊，这个应该说它的命名啊。那么当然，克拉克瓷器的名称还有很多种啊叫法，像日本人啊称为芙蓉手啊,啊。下一张。<咳>下一张，啊，你这个，哎，好，那么这张呢？啊，呃，刚上一张，上一张刚才过了，我再讲一下这个上一张啊，你调不过去吧？啊，对对对，那么这张就是葡萄牙的这个当时的十六到十七世纪的远航东方的大帆船克拉克啊。实际上，克拉克瓷器的命名呢，就是来由这船的啊，这个名称啊，像就是当时的贸易大帆船，因为在这种大帆船运送了大量的中国瓷器，特别是产自景德镇的青花瓷器啊，所以啊，称为克拉克瓷器。好，下一张。那么克拉克瓷器的典型装饰风格，实际上实际上它也是多种多样，但是呢，它以开光装饰啊，呃为突出的这个特征，就是特别是这盘的锐形，啊，因为这种克拉克瓷器以大盘为主，当然也有其他的平的碗呐、啊、菌石等锐形，但是数量最多的啊是这种大盘，而这种大盘的锐形以及外壁呢都有连续的。放射性的啊，这种开窗成为开光装饰的这种特征啊，那么这是我们呃对克拉克时期啊大家共同的一个认识，就是开光的这个特点，圆形的开光啊，一般有八个到十个这种啊开光装饰特征。<咳>下一张。那么这个就是收藏在土耳其托布卡比啊宫廷博物馆的一件啊克拉克瓷器，啊没关系，这个是在马来西亚这个南海啊海岸呢这个出水的，叫称为万宁号沉船的啊个这个克拉克瓷器。那么这条船呢，这个我曾经啊多次到马来西亚去考察。而且参观了、上手了这一批瓷器，确实量比较大啊。整个船可能有啊，也是有几万件呢、啊。这个克拉克瓷器，但是呢，它的质量呢，相对来说不是太高啊，还是当时呢，应该算只能说中低档的啊克拉克瓷器。但是数量最多的就是这种大盘，啊，带开光特征的大盘啊。那么。据研究呢，这个万料沉船呢，实际上是应该说，是一条这个这个荷兰人的啊贸易商船，但是被在马来西亚南海的海岸呢，被葡萄牙人呢拦截了，集成了啊，所以当时大概在啊万历啊末期或者说天启的初期，当然它的具体年代呢，这还有待于准确的考证。但是我认为，这条沉船的时间可能在天启初年、天启二年到左右啊。但是当时因为这个这个打捞的这个沉船的这个考古学啊，因为它风格认为像啊万历时期的，所以称为万历号啊。实际上它的年代可能晚一点啊啊，下一张。那么，由于景德镇生产的这种青花瓷器啊，在当时受到很多国家的这个，特别是
不但贵族、王室以及百姓的喜爱，所以啊，在包括中国的张周尧、日本的有田尧、荷兰的戴尔夫特以及伊朗，啊，包括啊西亚等地的很多啊，这个尧口啊都模仿。嗯，下一张，这个我们可以快一点。那这个是张周尧的啊、呃，这个对克拉克斯的仿制，但是呢，它不能成为克拉克瓷器，啊、呃，它是仿制对克拉克斯的仿制，啊，啊，可以，这个后面的可以快一点啊<咳>，啊，这个也是啊<咳>，这个是啊，这个就是伊朗十七世纪啊，那么有些仿品呢，确实跟景德镇的克拉克瓷器非常相似，甚至啊。可能一般的专家都不容易区分，那么最大的分，当然区分，当然包括胎跟釉，包括纹饰，实际上跟景德镇的克拉克瓷器，啊，仔细看都是有区别的，啊，这个我们就不具体展开了，啊，那么这里呢，重点讲一下克拉克瓷器的多种功能，啊，那么克拉克瓷器的功能呢，当然最主要的功能还是它的作为日用的陨石的器皿，啊，当然。啊、呃，这个功能，比如菜盘、果盘，这个是克拉克瓷器最主要的功能。那么这一点呢，在十七世纪的西方的油画中有大量的表现。啊，这个是最主要的功能，就是说作为石品，啊，石器啊，这个功能，作为生活的日用品。当然，其次，另外一个很重要的功能呢，我们发现呢，克拉克瓷器也作为在欧洲的宫廷。丝绿啊，也作为一种重要的装饰啊、呃，这个作用，所以具有很重要的装饰功能。同时呢，克拉克瓷器因为当时是非常珍贵的，因为欧洲当时不能生产出这个硬质瓷器出来，所以要靠大量从中国进口，特别是景德镇生产的高档的青花瓷器，也成为当时财富啊、时尚的象征。所以啊，啊，中国的青花瓷器，特别是景德镇的青花瓷器，大量。被当时的王公贵族啊，用于宫廷的装饰，显示自己的这个是吧财富啊，啊时尚啊，好下一张<咳>、啊，好，这张就是在欧洲油画中是吧？这个这个显示的克拉克自己当时的使用的具体的这个形象啊，都是装这种。啊、呃，这个，呃，食物啊，当然这种食物肯定都是名贵的食物啊，啊，当然这个形式也有，主要是盘，当然这个盘有一种浅盘，一种遮圆的深盘啊，有这个两种可以看得到啊。好，下一个啊，那么这个是在葡萄牙这个皇宫里面啊，一张。展现的大量食物啊，大量的克拉克瓷器啊，来装饰宫廷的顶部的啊这样一个照片，大家可能都也熟悉啊。好，下一张啊。那么这张也是荷兰油画中出现的啊，一张。你看，大量的克拉克瓷器呢，放在这个石绿的这个空间，这个啊、呃、中间部位，你看展示出来的啊。所以这个也主要是在装饰。另外呢，克拉克瓷器在中国实际上还有一个独特的一个功能，可能大家可能这个、呃、不是很了解。这里我重点也介绍一下，就说特别在。啊，江西，中国江西跟景德镇比较近的一个区域啊，我们发现了很多克拉克瓷器，当然都是残次品的克拉克瓷器啊，用于葬树的功能。那么这个在上一个世纪六十年代一直到现在，应该说都在不断的在江西的南城、广昌等地啊，在晚明的，也就是说十十七世纪的。啊，或者十六世纪晚期到十七世纪前上半叶的墓葬中，大量发现了一批克拉克瓷器的啊瓷盘，在墓葬里发现，所以这是一个很有意义、很值得研究的现象。而且我
，这些年实际上大量也在关注这一点。那么这些墓葬出土的克拉克时期呢，它有三个共同的特点，一个是主要是以盘类为主，第二个呢，这些盘实际上啊基本上没有完整的，主要都是有残的或者破的啊。当然也不是完全破，主要是开裂，特别是这个盘的中部或者边部啊开裂啊，所以它是做一种残次品。实际上，这种残次品应该说是不难出口的，是吧？但是呢，啊，当时的这个地区的人，是吧？啊，或者说窑工，景德镇的窑工没有把它毁掉，而是加以再利用，用于随葬啊，而且这些盘。根据我的对这个墓葬的考古的了解，它大部分是放在这个死者的头部底下啊，作为枕头的这样一个器物啊来使用的。下一张啊，这一件呢就是江西南城呢，江西抚州南城出土的这个克拉克斯盘。那么南城这个地方离景德镇大概啊。有一百多公里，有一百多公里啊！而且呢，为什么南城会有大量的这个克拉克？当然，这个刚才讲了，主要是藏书的需要。那么同时呢，根据我的研究啊，景德镇生产的克拉克瓷器啊，它要出口呢，它从它要经过南城呢、啊，啊，要经过南城，从这个我们的鄱阳湖流域，鄱阳湖。水域啊，经过南城的这个府河，再到福建，再到广东啊，或者说广东啊，这个出海啊，因为这个克拉克斯要卖到啊，销售到这个国外，当然或者说葡萄牙人或者是荷兰人，他一般是在福建的啊粤港，或者说啊这个汕头这个地区啊来采购，当然也有一部分是到澳门啊这个地方。啊，那么当时的粤港是主要的晚明时期，十七世纪啊，走私的贸易港口，所以大量的克拉克斯基是通过粤港啊外销出去的。那么呢，所以呢，在运送这个克拉克斯基的贸易商品过程中，我认为啊，应该有大量的啊，这个包括福州地区的这个艺术的商人呢，他参与说，他们能够获取这个克拉克斯基。所以景德镇的克拉克瓷器呢，就没有被打掉。这个残次品本来是肯定外国不需要的啊，不然是吧？用于外销的。但是呢，因为抚州地区呀、啊，有这种藏俗的需要，他认为这个克拉克瓷器本来他要购买这种是吧？圆形的而且薄的啊，这种盘呢，作为这个随葬，因为这个中间开裂，实际上这个正好适应了。这种啊，这个地区的这个人们的观念啊，因为中国人相信这个灵魂呢、啊，人死以后只是肉体会死去，但是灵魂是永远会存在的，是活的。他通过这个是吧，枕在头部底下，他的灵魂呢，可以通过这个缺口啊，可以上升到天国，重新是吧，在人间里面啊存在，所以正好。这个残次的克拉克斯，实际上呢，是因为这个中国啊，一些藏民的这种观念啊。好，下一张<咳>。那么这件实际上也是很有意义。这件盘呢，而且是福州地区出土的一件克拉克斯，而且中间也开裂了，而且它的底部，你看还带有中文的这个。啊，这个文字在上面，啊，这个文字是“仁和寺徐静寂”啊。那么这个“仁和”可能是这个应该说一个地名，或者说啊，那么寺徐一个是姓徐的啊一个人，他专门定制的作为这个随葬的，称为祭器。这个祭器就专门用于随葬的这个物质，称为祭器啊。那么也就是说，克拉克瓷器后来甚至成为一种专门的定制的需要了。不但是利用残次的克拉克瓷，而且甚至后来有意识的啊来定制，甚至这个落了款
，是吧？这个是专门用于水账的，啊，这个需要了，这个就是不是外销的克拉克瓷器了，这个就成为我们中国内销，而且用于作为祭祀水账的专门的一种用品，这种功能是吧？是非常奇特的啊。好，下一个<咳>。所以这一段话是我对江西抚州地区啊，这个晚明墓葬。克拉克瓷器盘的一个原因的分析，我认为首先造成这一独特现象的原因呢，是这一地区的人们具有打破通灵的啊撞书的观念。由于当时的人们普遍相信人死后啊，人的灵魂不会死去，他会离开人的尸体啊。那么通过这个出口啊，通过这个克拉克斯的出口裂口进入到仙境或者天堂。啊，而克拉克斯青花盘的裂缝正好是吧？是人的灵魂通向仙境的一个出口。因此，在这一地区的人们看来，完好无损的瓷盘实际上是不实用的，因为它完全封堵了灵魂的出口。啊，那么这样景德镇生产的这种残破的克拉克瓷器，实际上它没有被丢弃，反而能够适应了这一地区人们的撞书的观念，所以被这个啊。能够接近到景德镇克拉克瓷的这个用于外销的玉器的人们，啊、呃，重新再次利用。第二个原因就是刚才讲了，江西抚州地区的南城、广昌的，在明代后期也是景德镇瓷器外销路线的重要的必经地区，而且很可能明代后期的南城、广昌一带的人们还直接参与了景德镇克拉克瓷器的外销的运输，所以他们才能够接触到。大量几十生产的克拉克斯基的饰品，而且把这些啊销售到了南城、广昌一带，啊，所以十六世纪中叶到十七世纪中叶，啊，景德镇这个外销主要是通过啊这个这个海上的这一条道路啊啊，通过福建、漳州、粤港和广州啊销售到世界各地去的啊。好，下一个。好，有关克拉克瓷器的，呃，这个关于跟丝绸之路的关系，特别它的功能呢、啊，我就啊，因为时间关系就介绍这里啊，谢谢大家。嗯，到了几点了？花了多长时间了？嗯。Thank you, Dr. Cha, for that really interesting paper about <coughs> and、um, getting us to think about not just the foreign markets but also the domestic market. Um, and interesting recycling practices.、Uh, for those of you who are in Singapore, you can see black porcelain pieces at the ACM in the Maritime Trade Gallery.、Um, for we are moving on to our last、um, paper, and we have Dr.、Um, Sarah Fee, who's going to be、um, speaking to us about bombic silk. And Dr. Sarah Fee, senior curator of fashion and textiles at the Royal Ontario Museum, and affiliated faculty at the University of Toronto's Department of Art, she holds degrees in anthropology and African studies from Oxford University, and from the School of、um, Oriental、um, Civilizations in Paris. For over thirty years, she has carried out multidisciplinary research on hand weaving and dress in Madagascar. And the Western Indian Ocean Rim. She has lectured and published numerous works on these topics. In 2018, she was awarded the 2018 Passel Foundation Textile History Essay Prize.、Um, Dr. Sarah Fee is today going to talk to us about circulations in bombic silk in the Western Indian Ocean in the 19th century.、Um, Dr. Fee. Thank you very much, and please bear with me, everyone, as I. Share my screen and get it going. Can you see the PowerPoint? Are we good to go? Yes.、Yep. Thumbs up. Okay. Here we go. So, hello and greetings, everyone.、Um, Greetings from a very balmy night in Toronto, which I'm sure you in Singapore can relate to. It's unusually hot and humid. So, my thanks to the Asian Civilization Museum and the conference organizers, especially Stephen Murphy, 
uh, for inviting me to participate. And I think it's fitting that I actually come last tonight. And that's because my paper in terms of the time and geography uh, sit on the fringes of the conference, uh, fringes in space. Um, I'll be mostly speaking about Madagascar and the Western uh, Indian Ocean Rim. And also on the fringes in terms of time because I will be speaking about the 19th century, far from where we've been tonight. So you might call it the western terminus of the Indian Ocean Maritime Silk Roads. So harking back to the wonderful keynote talk by Dr. Sen in, re in regards to dissecting the expression Maritime Silk Road, I'm, I'm stressing the plural roots versus one singular monolithic road. Um, I think I also get some brownie points because I think I am the only speaker who's actually addressing silk. So this presentation emerges from my recent research into the interconnected weaving worlds of the Western Indian Ocean, which traces the textiles and techniques that circulated between Gujarat, Oman, Yemen, Somalia, the Swahili coast, and Madagascar in the 19th century. And one of these connections was silk. I'll be looking at three kinds of basic types of silk circulation that we need to distinguish analytically. First of all, silk cloth. Secondly, silk filament. And finally, uh, Bombex sericulture or the actual uh, raising of silkworms. My approach in the study is multidisciplinary. I've been combining archival research, museum collections, and ethnographic field research in Oman, Gujarat, and Eastern Africa. So earlier trade histories of Eastern Africa focused mainly on what was going out, as you can see in the titles of these classic works, ivory, spices, and human captives. In the past decade, there has been a new wave of research on what was coming in on the products demanded by African traders and consumers, and that to a large degree was imported cloth. Now the bulk of these studies focus on one kind of cloth that was imported into Eastern Africa, cottons or so-called Indian cottons. And that can be related in part to this larger intellectual interest in cotton as a global commodity. Uh, my own research shows that a significant minority of textiles imported into Eastern Africa were in fact all or part silk. The silks were destined for Arab and Swahili elites on the coast and demanded by the rulers of the ivory trade in the interior, just as Indian patola silks were demanded in the spice trade of Southeast Asia. These were not only luxury fashions, these imported silks, but also political necessities required for creating and maintaining networks of trade and political influence. A minority of imports, but a crucial one. Now the Western Indian Ocean remains absent from most books on global silk weaving and trades, including this recent title from 2018. You can see that Eastern Africa uh, is blank on their map. So today what I'm going to be doing is sharing my own maps of East African Bombic silt routes in the 19th century. And my apologies, I'm not an archaeologist. Uh, my maps are pretty crude and they're made even cruder by the fact that because of COVID I didn't have any summer interns this year who are usually very handy with helping with uh, technology. Now, of course, by the 19th century, silk cloths entering East Africa had for many centuries already been coming not from China, but from Gujarat in Western India. More specifically, by about 1830, the area of Kutch uh, and Port of Manvi were exporting small amounts of silk cloth to Zanzibar and to Madagascar. French records tell us that Gujarati merchants annually sent two ships to Western Madagascar filled with a cloth, a silk cloth called a kuti. And I'll return to this a kuti cloth uh, later in my talk. 
Edward Elpers in a revisit of a 17th century list of imports into Mozambique also identifies some silk textiles. So what were these Gujarati silks? Um, to date, um, despite all my combing through many museum collections, all I've managed to locate are two Gujarati uh, examples destined for Zanzibar, both of them at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. So on the left, what you can see uh, is mashru, that's a mixed cotton and silk with the silk warp and the cotton weft uh, made so that the silk is pushed to the surface. If you look in the upper right, you can see um, a picture of a mid 19th century uh, Swahili family. So this would have been the type of uh, silk head wrap that an elite Swahili woman might wear. And on the right, you see what is probably the dually cloth uh, which uh, in one of my earlier slides was on the list of Henry Morton Stanley's uh, textiles that he carried into the interior. And it would have been worn uh, either as a body wrapper or perhaps as a turban by an elite Swahili man. Now, while Gujarat may not be a surprise, um, actually, uh, even more active in creating and exporting silks to Eastern Africa in the 19th century, it appears, was Oman. Oman, as everyone here will know, uh, was for centuries a dominant maritime force in the Indian Ocean. And everyone will likely know as well that the Sultan of Oman in about 1830 relocated his capital from Muscat to Zanzibar in Eastern Africa. You see here one of his trusted envoys, Ahmed Ibn Nama, and you can note the silk turban and waist sash he is wearing, and they were both likely actually manufactured in Oman itself. Now it's little remembered today, um, but Oman was also a land of artisans historically. From the 1700s at least, large numbers of weavers were active in all the major Omani ports, weaving cottons and silk for export, some to the Gulf, but most of it, it seems, to Eastern Africa. Omani trade textiles, for the most part, imitated Gujarati striping patterns, but they also created novel striping patterns destined for the East African market. Here on the left, you can see one of these. It is uh, the Barwazi. And in um, these textiles that I found, and there aren't many that um, were collected by museums because they were at the point of manufacture um, export items and at the point of entry imports. So they were considered uh, valid ethnographic examples. So very few have actually been collected. Um, but what I know is that most of them have a silk border, the red, yellows, uh, in, on the selvages were silk and the interior tended to be made of cotton. So by the mid 1800s, Omani textiles replaced Gujarati's most expensive and coveted imports in Eastern Africa. They were worn by elite Swahili men and women as turbans and wrappers. And they were also coveted by rulers in the African interior as ceremonial wear. So how did Oman edge out Gujarati cloths? perhaps it was partly tied to its better access to silk floss. Now, neither Gujarat nor Oman had Bombex Seri culture, so where did their weavers get silk filament? They also relied on imports. By the 18th century, if not earlier, Oman relied on imports of silk filament from Iran. As you know, Iran from the 6th century at least had its own Bombex Seri culture and exported its excess filament um, down the Gulf. Uh, and this is what uh, Rudolf Mati has called the North-South Silk Road. Indeed, once Oman came to control the mouth of the Gulf in the late 1600s, it also came to control the important flow of silk filament in the Gulf. Now, Bengal as well um, became active from the 16th century in producing and exporting Bombay silk filament to Gujarat, but so did Iran but I've had uh, less success to date documenting those links. Now there's uh, been a long ongoing debate for many decades about whether imports into Eastern Africa deindustrialized it or actually stimulated weaving. 
Um, and what I have found in terms of silk is to a certain extent, it stimulated weaving in some times and places. Both along the Swahili coast and in Madagascar, weavers unraveled imported silks and used the thread to make their own cloth. It, this has been documented more so for uh, the Swahili coast than for Madagascar. But linguistic evidence suggests that the famous Akutifana cloth of Madagascar that you see here probably has its origins in weaving, in weavers unraveling the imported Gujarati silk called Akuti that I mentioned earlier in the talk and then reweaving it. So voracious were the Malagasy weavers for silk filament. From at least the early 1800s, Omani merchants began carrying silk filament directly to the island. They sailed up the rivers of Madagascar to the royal capital in the central highlands to sell both undyed silk and a pre-dyed red silk that was especially desired. Adding Bombex, Silk revolutionized weaving in Madagascar with new textures, patterns, and colors. Weavers used it to complement their own indigenous wild silk, which uh, was rougher. Um, it had to be spun and it couldn't be reeled. It was more almost um, like a hemp. And so here is one of the popular styles that emerged with the introduction of Bombix, uh, Cicin de Soie which in where in the Bombic silk has been used to form stripes along the selvages. And here's just one more example. Um, that is all silk, um, including a silk weft with which sources told us was the most precious imported silk from Oman. Now, all of these come from the Rom's own collections donated by the missionary William Ellis, who was active in Madagascar uh, in the 1850s. And finally, Bombic Seri culture itself came to Madagascar as a result of early British uh, colonial machinations. Now, it's, it's a complicated story. I wish I had time to say more about it. I'll just say that research by Gwyn Campbell and Simon Pierce shows that um, as one outcome of diplomatic dealings between the King of Madagascar, Radama I, who you see in the top right, and Robert Farquhar, the British governor of neighboring Mauritius Island, shown in the bottom right, uh, Farquhar sent Radama mulberry bushes, silkworms from Bengal, as well as Bengali convict laborers to teach the Malagasy to raise, reel, and weave silk. It was part of a much uh, larger and more ambitious program of um, industrialization in the island. Now, Governor Farquhar, of course, wanted Madagascar to export the raw silk to Britain for its own weaving industry. This ultimately failed. Instead, sericulture was appropriated. Oops, there's my last map route of the silk roots. Um, so as I was saying, uh, it failed as a, an export project. Instead, sericulture was appropriated by Madagascar's own weavers for domestic production. And to this day, it remains an active industry. So to conclude, uh, the Western terminus of the maritime silk road is alive and well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fee, for that wonderful paper on silk and bringing us back to um, and uh, for painting that really complicated story, showing us those connections between India, um, um, the Swahili coast, and Oman, Iran, Madagascar, and Mauritius. So we've come to the end of this um, wonderful panel. We've had um, five um, really interesting papers, and there are over nearly nearly 250 participants who asked so many questions. So I'm gonna um, turn it over to Lester now. Thank you very much, Dr. Sujata. Uh, well, I'm sure all of you will agree with me. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. I, I personally, I've learned so much from it as well. So I, I believe all of you have. And you know, I, I've seen the, some of the questions asked. Uh, some of the panelists have replied as well, but this is the session where this, or rather this is the section where we are going to dive in. You can 
ask your questions directly to our panelists and they will be discussing some of the questions that you have posted as well. Gentle reminder how you can do it. Uh, click the Q&A icon at the bottom or at the top of your screen, submit your questions. Uh, and of course, you do remember, you can also like the question or the comment and our panel chair, Dr. Sujata, may pick up on your question. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'll hand the time back over to our panel chair, Dr. Sujata, together with all our panelists. We're going to bring them all up on screen for our panel discussion. Dr. Sujata, please. Thank you, Lester. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief response, um, some comments um, uh, summarizing this panel um, before we turn uh, to the numerous questions that, that are um, coming in. Um, there are a couple of things that I think tie all these um, uh, wonderful papers together. And um, something that we heard um, from Dr. Tansen Sen's keynote to the two panels we heard yesterday and the papers we just heard now, um, really shift our attention to see abortions in various ways. And for me, as someone who's been creating art history, this is quite refreshing because I think we've been stuck on land um, for far too long until the oceanic turn in um, area studies in art history. And even then, our attention has been focused mostly on the early modern, um, as if the Indian Ocean was sort of brought to life uh, by European interlocutors when they arrived here in the 16th century, a nod, of course, to Michael Pearson. As we heard on Friday night, there are many terms that we can use to refer to this world in which your objects traveled. Um, and we learned of a new one today, at least for me it's new. Uh, maritime Silk Roads, Maritime Asia, Monsoon Asia, the Indian Ocean, and um, thanks to Dr. Chow's presentation, the China Road or Porcelain Road. And I choose to think or locate your objects from an Indian Ocean lens for various reasons, um, similar to the global turn and the oceanic turn, um, that shares this concern of going beyond the nation state, your um, papers do that uh, beautifully, and also going beyond our narrow silos of area studies. Um, the field itself has been around for 50 years and has been written about and theorized about in many different productive ways in different disciplines. And some of the um, oldest questions are, um, is there a unity to the Indian Ocean? Uh, or what are the boundaries of the Indian Ocean? But I think what your papers do is that it really shows that, that not only there is, is there a unity, but there's also a diversity. And your papers also extend the boundaries of the Indian Ocean, which we might think um, begin on the Swahili coast in East Africa and extend to the shores of Singapore, where we are, or some of us are. But in fact, we can extend further to the Mediterranean world, to West Africa, to the Iberian Peninsula, um, while in the other direction, uh, we can push all the way to push the boundaries all the way to Asia, and even across the Pacific, as we heard yesterday, to Ensenada. Um, apart from that, what uh, your papers also do something very um, striking as well, because um, they not only engage with the oceanic turn, but they also engage with the global turn and the material turn. We heard narratives about ceramics, metals, um, textiles, sorry, culture, and although some might think that these are luxury commodities, I would argue that I heard narratives also about um, non-elite agents, such as weavers and potters. Um, uh, and um, so another sort of interesting theme that goes throughout all your papers would be production and consumption. And finally, your papers also illustrate that it's possible to speak of the Indian Ocean as an aesthetic space, a visual seascape in which all our sensual perceptions are engaged, um, sight, touch, smell, sound, taste. And the papers of this particular panel really, um, as well as the conference, clearly point to the possibility of this shared material culture of the Indian Ocean world. So we, uh, along with these sort of general comments, um, I turn to the questions that we've had so many coming in. And I think I'll start off with um, some questions for Dr. Chow so that the translator can um, translate it um, 
um, quickly. And we, I, think we, I think we've had two questions about um, whether this practice of breaking the crack porcelain is very specific to that particular region. Um, was it only during that time period? Um, and also has anything been published? I believe we have two questions on um, that.根据我们目前的这个研究在江西的一部分地区如果景德镇克拉克自己停烧了在世纪世纪晚期到十八世纪啊，都还在流行啊，是是我的这个啊一个认识。呃，主持人啊，有没有听清楚啊？他比较卡。Thank you, thank you for those um answers. And um, we also have some questions, lots of questions uh, for everybody. Um, we have some questions for John um, about the green smashed ware, about the um, whether it, um, from uh, Ian McCann, who's asking John, some of the decoration on the green splashed ware appears to be applied with an absorbent material. For example, a sponge and does not appear to be splashed. Has this been considered? John, we can't hear you. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, yes, I mean, my understanding is that these uh, uh, decorations are. Uh, 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 flipped on with a brush, as it were, not um, smeared with a sponge. Um, but um, not being a practicing potter, um, I mean, I'd like to give a definitive answer. To oh, that. yeah, 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 that is it. We, we, do have, we have another question for you oh, yeah, 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 yeah. about the meaning of the dragon from Hyung Mi King. Uh, and it's about um, how I get uh, meaning. Meaning of the dragon in Middle East was different from Chinese culture in China. Was the dragon popular in the Middle East as well? John, were 
done in some of these green splash wear mm -hmm. and, uh, what it may have meant in the Middle East and whether it was popular in the Middle East as it was in China. Okay, this is questions to do with the, the molded dragon motif in the center of the yes. of the small saucer dish. Yes, I mean that, that's that's it. Uh, the molded technology is something we generally accept as, as being an innovation in the Northern Song period and then taken to new heights in the uh, later Song and Yuan. Um, and here it is appearing in the early ninth century, um, a good hundred years earlier than previously thought. So. Um, Another instance, I guess, of the Bellatung um, obliging us on the basis of external evidence uh, to revisit uh, accepted orthodox interpretations of, of, of the internal history of ceramic making uh, in China. Um, the uh, discovery of that fragment from excavations in Nishapur in the 1930s from the Metz excavations, um, uh, again, witnesses that this, this trade was uh, penetrated deep into the hinterland of Iran um, and wasn't purely confined to the coasts. And again, the, the Belatong, um, I thought it's to step back from this, just to say that the Belatong in a way um, is an extraordinary uh, piece of documentation, but it also uh, is, should not be totally surprising in that it really gives archaeological vindication to a whole corpus of Arabic and Persian sources, and to a lesser extent, Chinese sources, contemporary to this period, uh, which speak repeatedly about this long distance trade dynamic. Uh, but we were lacking the archeological evidence to give full credence to those texts. Now we have the, the archeology span in one hand, the text in the other, and they fit like a glove, hand to glove. And so it, it closes that circle, if you like. And, and that little the little saucer dish with the um, molded decoration of the dragon is just one more indication of this coming together of textual and archaeological data. Thank you. Thank you, John. So we also have um, some questions for Dr. Amanda Resbeth, and um, we have questions about um, uh, uh, from Bernard Green, who at the Changsha Kiln would have the knowledge to design the Islamic and pseudo-Islamic inscriptions on the ceramics? Great. Um, so I think that some of the questions that I actually um, answered by saying that that would be a good that would be a good conversation for the Q and A. It was just sort of too lengthy to type, but. Um, I think one of the exciting things about looking at these bowls from the standpoint of um, the Islamicate world and Persianate design is that it opens up a, a different way of thinking about production. Um, I'm thinking back to the opening uh, panel and Dr. Chittick's discussion of household production of the bowls. I think that that is something we need to explore and is a really exciting area. In my experience, looking at the bowls, there are some that are beautiful. They are written in such a way that they are they are calligraphically moving and you can recognize even a penmanship and the way that different letters are put together. It's, it's clearly executed by someone who knows what they're doing um, and is literate. Not all of the bowls are like that. What that means, I don't know. I don't know if that means that certain bowls are holotypes. Um, I don't know if that means that certain persons and certain household workshops speak and write Persian. I think that something we need to really think about and consider in Tang Dynasty China is that we have long histories of Persian and Muslim presence uh, in Yangzhou, Hangzhou, and the entire sort of Grand Canal region. Um, and Liu Yang has written about how after the uh, massacre in Yangzhou that a lot of people, including Muslims who had survived, went south, they migrated, and a lot of them brought their ceramic skills with them to Changsha. So we do know that there are just generations also of intermarriage. So I think this opens up avenues of exploration. So I don't have an answer of exactly who and how, uh, but I think if we work up from the objects and then start to kind of form our questions, that will be really helpful. So we'll be looking forward to your future research on these bowls. Um, and um, there were also um, some questions for um, um, 
Dr. Fee. And um, I'm just trying to scroll through the questions and um, find the latest one that came in. Um, What's the technique producing silk in Gujarat and Oman imported from China? Or did they develop their own style? Were they the silkworm um, originally in this, was the silkworm originally there in these regions? Uh, yeah, um, maybe I, I didn't make it explicit enough, but uh, in both cases of Gujarat and Oman, uh, they, they are too arid to actually raise silkworms, so they imported the filament or the floss. So they themselves never had actual silkworms and sericulture, to my knowledge. Uh, instead, they had to import it. So they imported from Bengal and from Iran the actual filament. Uh, it's my understanding, too, that with the spread of uh, sericulture, the the most difficult part was the, the mulberry was because these domesticated moss, um, uh, the eggs they lay, the worms can only feed on mulberry bushes. It was impossible to keep those uh, alive on long ship voyages. So it was really hop skips um, that got them to the various places that they did. And the highlands of Madagascar just happened to have the, the perfect climactic conditions that uh, enable them to raise it themselves. So I hope that answers that. Thank you. And we have um, some questions once again for Sean about the meaning um, or possible meanings with this um, color green flashware, the green. And um, there's also another question about the specific meaning of the diamond palmet. Uh, in particular, the elaborate ones displayed on the belly tomb dragon ewer plate and colored container beyond aesthetics alone. Could they have been talismanic or perhaps an illusion to paradise or perhaps another meaning? John, you need to unmute. We can't hear you. Thank you. Okay, with you. Uh, it's very curious that that, that, that motif on the Battle of Tumba material, the white wares, the green splashed, and so on. Um, the law sent with the Palmet projections, uh, which has a very clear um, um, ancestry in the Upper Persian Gulf and almost certainly around the Basra area. We know the uh, kilns have been um, um, active in the 8th and 9th century in that area. Um, and this motif uh, evolved through uh, the next two centuries. Uh, it's, it's, it's alien to China. I mean, we don't see it. It has no place in the known repertoire of Chinese ceramic decorations. What it means in the Arab and Persian world, um, I f do not know, and I'm not aware that the design is given a, an explanation. Um, and um, I'd welcome comments from Amanda or others uh, who may have some thoughts on this. Um, but it, it, it's uh, some of the, there are elements in the way it's treated uh, that uh, reference uh, architecture, uh, this may, may reference sort of um, water source uh, structures, uh, architectural element with plants, oasis um, uh, type of referencing, uh, but that's speculation. We really, um, I'm not aware of any other sources. Um, if Amanda has any comments to make, I'd be very happy to have her contribution. Thank you. Um, I think that I loved what was in the question about the idea of the Chahar Bagh, the garden, the four, uh, four zoned garden. I think that's a beautiful possibility with the lozenge motif. Um, I think the number four, even in terms of not the shape, but just the angles that are created is also very meaningful um, in Persian uh, cosmological thinking. So that's a possibility, but beyond that, I don't know. Thank you, um, John and Amanda. Um, we also have some questions for Dr. Ray. And, um, and I know that um, Himanshi, you've answered some of these in the answered section, but um, perhaps you can expand on these. Um, there's a question from Rie Ong who has asked about the term trade and how it uh, limits um, your argument that it limits our understanding of um, maritime connections. And um, so, so then what kind of term or framework would you propose in order to better contextualize? Uh, 
Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, um, should I go ahead and answer the question? Yes, please. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, the uh, the way trade has been studied and um, uh, has been um, as relationship between empires and states and that the political elite requiring luxury goods. Um, so in the pre-modern period, I'm really talking about the pre 12th, 13th century period. Uh, and there's a distinction between, you know, how it has been studied in the earlier period and how it has been studied for the European uh, colonization and European trade. So essentially it has been looked at as uh, a movement of luxury commodities between empires and states and um, uh, as uh, something which was really required by the elite. Now, what does it leave out? What it leaves out, and especially if we are talking about the ocean, what it leaves out are the fishing and sailing communities. The traders did not sail. The traders sometimes owned ships. Sometimes they sailed. But it was the fishing and sailing communities who were really the foundation of these voyages. So we need to uh, bring in the fishing and sailing communities who were mobile. We also need to bring in the, 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 the different, the diversity of people who moved on the ships. And again, you know, by looking at just cargoes and by looking at trade, uh, we do not talk about musicians. There are references, there are very early references to musicians going. There are also early references to the, the clergy or, you know, to um, Buddhist monks and nuns, Brahmins, but also other, um, other um, uh, denominations. Uh, so I think that um, in the literature, uh, what has happened is that there has been a tremendous um, focus on luxury items, commodities, uh, and the elite. And what it has left out are, you know, the production centers, the weavers, the, uh, the producers, the artisans, but more importantly, the fishing and sailing communities. And in this day and age, when we are trying to preserve and we are trying to talk about, you know, the environment and heritage, I think leaving out mobile communities is a real disaster. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that wonderful answer. Um, I, we also have uh, some questions. I will come back to you, Dr. Ray, because there are a couple of questions, um, some more questions for you, but I wanted to um, also bring attention to um, two questions for Dr. Chow, since we will need a translator, uh, the translator for that. Um, there was a question about, um, and I'm trying to focus again, um, this, the Why did the, from uh, Audrey Toad, Dr. Chow, why did the trends of crack not continue after the 15th century in China? And um, mm. then um, there's also a second question from Bernard Law. Is there any logical explanation for buried ceramics that are not at burial sites? This phenomenon is happening in Indonesia. Many used metal pole to detect buried treasures. Uh 
，十八世纪就不多了，已经很少了，啊，应该是这种情况啊。Thank you。这个肖米呢，我我觉得可能后来有其他的风格的瓷器产生，一个是这个，另外呢，可能跟荷兰人呢、啊、葡萄牙人的影响，因为后来葡萄牙人衰落，因为克拉克自己的姓氏呢，开始是葡萄牙人啊、呃、主导的，啊、呃，然后是荷兰人啊、呃、在接着打败了葡萄牙人，然后他是吧占领了这个海上贸易的这个啊。呃统治权，那么这个衰落呢？我觉得跟首先是葡萄牙人呢衰落有密切的关系。其次呢，荷兰人后来也被英国、法国取代了，可能这个也有密切的关系。克拉克斯跟他们的，当然最后可能有景德镇，后来又生产了更多风格的瓷器，啊，可能逐渐的也有一个很重要的原因，取代了克拉克的风格。但是我认为最主要是葡萄牙人的衰落有密切的关系，啊。Thank you. Um, and I think we also have a question for Amanda again. And Amanda, and I think Amanda, you said that you're going to answer this question live. Does this from Sunny Wibison? Does this Changsha glaze color have any? In the Islamic world? Right. So one of the questions that came through was if the color of the uh, designs had any possible symbolic meaning. And I think so. That's a great question. I really appreciate it. Um, so green and brown are the primary uh, colors that you see on the Changsha bowls. Green is definitely a very powerful symbolic color in um, Persian culture, representing spring. Uh, Nauru's and Zoroastrianism, it's a center of kind of the rebirth of the year. Um, but there are actually a few bowls that are red, that the designs are red uh, because of the way that the chemical processes worked. And I think um, in the gallery, when you're there at the ACM, there's one bowl that just sort of jumps uh, jumps out at you. And I think that for a lot of people who see it, who have any kind of familiarity with Persian and Arabic, it's one of the ones that first gets you thinking about the textuality of these. Um, red, uh, in if you're reading a Quran, red is a really important color for text. It will divide sections. Um, important text is often in red, so titles, section dividers, you see it in manuscripts, any kind of manuscript as well. And so seeing seeing Allah, you know, in red and seeing it even with um, vocalization markings is just an incredibly powerful thing to see uh, on a material object in China that was produced in China in the ninth century. And it raises all kinds of questions about what was happening um, with the people that produced and ordered these and their relationship to textuality. Um, thank you for that answer. And uh, returning to Dr. Ray, uh, we have two questions for you, um, which I think you've um, sort of addressed in your answers, but maybe you can expand on them. Um, from Hyungmi Kim, um, she asks, um, we often see an interaction or coexistence of Hinduism and Buddhism in Southeast Asia, but the Benetton shipwreck shows only Buddhist objects. Can you guess why? If it if it is because only Buddhism spread into China, not Hinduism, can you please explain? Um, thank you. Um, the ob yes, the objects um, uh, that have been um, preserved from the Belitung show Buddhism, but there are other objects that we find in other shipwreck sites, uh, which do show uh, Hinduism spreading. And in China, I think Hinduism spread uh, quite effectively. There were Hindu temples um, in South China uh, as a result of Tamil merchant guilds. Uh, so there is, uh, there is the coexistence of both uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, I am a little uncomfortable uh, because, um, you know, choosing um, uh, A with categories because swastika itself is both Hindu and Buddhist. It's auspicious uh, both for Hinduism and for Buddhism. 
Uh, and secondly, um, also uh, uncomfortable uh, because of the fact that, um, you know, the way collections are made, I think there is a certain, um, uh, how should one say, a bias towards what we know. Um, so I hope that answers my question. It does. Um, and I completely agree with you that we need to go beyond um, categories since there's so many shared visual traditions. Um, in um, with, between Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, there was also a question from um, Faisal Hasni who has asked, um, did these coastal shrine service stops before or after trips to ensure safe travels or as thanks of them? And I think there was um, much like um, the Dargah has been known to function. And I think there was also a question uh, about rituals on board from another participant. So perhaps you can sort of expand a little bit about pilgrimage and the function of these coastal shrines? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for both those questions. And um, coastal shrines, uh, if we bring in, let me put it differently, if we bring in mobile communities, if we bring in, bring in fishing and sailing communities, they need to worship as well. And they did worship as well. And one of the shrines, uh, you know, on uh, Sakotra. Uh, the island of Sakotra, where travelers went from uh, the Gujarat or the Kutch coast, uh, it started off uh, as a rock cut, the, the Hawk cave or the cave shrine, but subsequently developed into a shrine for Brahmanical religion. So when one is looking at coastal shrines, um, one needs to bring into discussion, not just, um, uh, you know, not just the hinterland people, but also the coastal people, the mobile people, the people who traveled across the seas. And their fishing and sailing communities uh, play an important role. And um, uh, in, uh, at coastal shrines in Gujarat, I, I didn't have time to talk about that, but uh, in, um, in many regions, in Tamil Nadu, as well as in, uh, in Gujarat, uh, they start off as, they're, they're worshiped in, you know, in a variety of ways. And, now, this is too complex to explain because I think we've got so stuck to Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam that we don't see we don't see the interstices and we don't see the diversity of the same shrine uh, being holy and considered auspicious and sacred by votaries um, of uh, different uh, religions. I'm not sure if that's making any sense, but, um, you know, um, I think coastal shrines are important for mobile communities. They are important as centers of pilgrimage. They are also important as places for Thanksgiving. Uh, 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 also, the patrons often are the communities themselves, you know, the traders, trading groups, uh, the sailors. And we have lots of